Good morning, everyone. Are you ready for God to speak to you and touch your heart and change you forever? Yes. Oh, good. You should be very glad that you are here today. You should be very glad that you're watching this online today. God is going to do something amazing. So why don't you just give yourself to him and just say, Lord Jesus, speak to me today. Father, we do. We ask you to fill this place with even an increase of your presence. Thank you for your presence that came during worship. But I bless this church. We bless your people. We bless those watching wherever, whenever. We declare you, my Lord, would bless every word that comes forth today. That you would prepare hearts, prepare minds, and that you would cause us to think like you, love like you, and live like you. And everyone said... Amen. Well, uh, I, I get to share today on uh, the message before Christmas. Carol started our Christmas series last week, and she did an amazing job. She shared on God knows what it is to be human. And uh, he came as a child. He didn't come as a God in all his glory to terrify those that he came to. He came as a little child, and he knows what it's like to be human. And Carol shared from Isaiah 9, which we should have declared at the beginning. Most of you have memorized your Bibles anyway, right, from beginning to end. And Isaiah 9, that scripture that talks about, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Now, that is a great phrase for Christmas. You hear it all the time. I, you know, we, we always hear this around Christmas time, but Christmas without gifts is still Christmas. Christmas without a holiday is still Christmas. Christmas without a tree is still Christmas. Christmas without turkey. Are you getting the idea? Is still Christmas. Christmas without Christ so a lot of people are just celebrating this year a miss. There's no Christ in their Christ miss. So they miss the Christ and all they have is miss. And they try to celebrate and get something out of it by how much they eat, how much they drink, or whatever friends they can hang out with. But you know what? There's more of Jesus. And if we, every time we have these moments like Easter and Christmas, take time to say, Jesus, we want more of you. We want to take this time to remember the son that was given. And this was no ordinary child. Would you agree? You know, when God, when we celebrate Christmas, it's God giving us this child. But a lot of people are quite happy to celebrate the baby in a manger, right? Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. He puts no requirements on me, this little baby in a manger. He's just a cute little kid. And we celebrate this little baby. But what does Isaiah say? This was no ordinary child that we're celebrating. To us, a son is given. The government will be on his shoulders, right? We don't talk about this about just any child. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's who we're celebrating. Jesus didn't just come to be a baby in a manger. He came to be celebrated as King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the one who governs, the one in control, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's who we're celebrating. Amen? And so when we, when we talk about God sending His Son, what motivated Him to send His Son, by the way? What motivated God to send Jesus? Was it just because He... Didn't want you all to go to hell. And we know that he doesn't. It says he wants no one to perish. He wants all to be saved. John 3.16 answers that question for us. Everyone know this one? For God, say it with me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, we often stop there, but we need to catch the heart of verse 17 as well. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. So, we as followers of Christ, since the church in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians there, which means little, little Christ-like ones. To be a Christian means to be like Christ, right? Right? So if Jesus came to love the world and express a love for the world, not to condemn the world, but to save the world, then we as Christians and the church are on that same mission. 
the mission to love the world. Hmm. We'll get into this a little bit more. (laughs) But the true message of Christmas, friends, is the message of love. The true message in your hearts that God wants to shed abroad. He doesn't mind us getting gifts on Christmas, but if you miss out on the gift of His unconditional, unlimited love, you're missing out on the very point of Christmas, the very point of why He sent His Son. You know, I've, I've been listening to a message by just a well-known minister in the U.S., one of my favorites, very funny man, Chris Valentin. Some of you might know him. And he says this. He says, you know, when he counsels, and I can agree with this, about 85% of people that come for counseling don't know that they loved. I can guarantee that a lot of you sitting here today, a lot of you watching, some of you sitting outside today, don't feel loved. It is part of the broken human condition in the world in which we live. And too many have grown up unloved and then come into churches where the church has got everything, got it right, beautiful sound, excellent multimedia, but no love. Guys, if we don't have love, we're nothing. This might well be the most important message of Christmas that you may ever hear. 1 John 4, 7 says again, this is how God showed that he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world that we might live in him. Adam and Eve in the garden walked away from love. It was God's love that said, I don't want my children to not live with me in a loving family. So God stepped down and he gave everything. And so we talk about when it's Christmas time, gifts. And some of you, I don't know, you talk about the gift that keeps giving. Ever heard about the gift that keeps giving? I don't know, there might be many of those, like maybe a coffee machine. To me, that's the gift that keeps giving. (laughs) If any of you are wondering what to give me for Christmas. But, But I want to talk today about living in the love that keeps giving. Living in the love that keeps giving. For God so loved that he gave. Love always gives. I want to look briefly in the seven hours that we have left to us today. Three, three quick aspects of this. Love always gives. We as a church, we embrace the last words of Jesus in Matthew 28. Go make disciples of all nations. But do you know that love is the mark of true discipleship? And thirdly, the most important thing that I find was the hardest thing for me and might be one of the hardest things for you because the world that we grow up in is learning how to live in that love. How many of you feel like God loves you so much that you just can't express it? How many of you would like to have some of that before you leave today? How many of you would like to have a greater revelation and receive more of his love revealed inside of you? Man, me, (laughs) I'm not there, but boy, I know if we don't get love right, then we miss everything. And by the end of this message, you'll know why. So let's look at this. Love always gives. A child is born, a son is given. God so loved the world that he gave. Love always gives. Now, There are many different kinds of loves. Would you agree? I love my dog. I love my dogs. How many of you love your dogs? Any dog lovers here? Hallelujah. We're in the right company. Those of you that don't love your dogs, please come up for ministry afterwards. We will lay hands on you. We believe in canine kindness. There's a word in scripture that talks about, you know, a loving man cares for his animals. I buy into that. I'd be running a rescue farm if I could. But I love my dog. I love my wife. I love that TV show that makes me laugh. (laughs) I love my coffee. I love how that person makes me feel. So there are many different kinds of loves. The Greeks had a number of different words that are all translated love in English. And they had about five of them. But there is phileo love, which is friendship. I love my friend. There's storge, which is my love for my dog or my love for my coffee. You know, I storge my coffee. There is eros, 
which is, I mean, we see that all the time. The movies are full of it. That is the romantic, erotic love that a man has for a woman and a woman for a man. But then, then there's the unconditional, unlimited love of God, agape, uh, commonly known as agape amongst the English. The agape love of God. And I want to tell you that is unlike any love that you can experience in your human side only. Most of us, when we think about love and the relationships we have, marriage, the world's idea of love typically is not one that it all is about me giving. It is so often about what I get out of the relationship. I love my wife because of how she makes me feel, because she gives me this, because she does that for me. And so often love in the world is defined by what we get out of it. And we go looking because, because so many of us feel unloved. We will do anything to feel loved. Ever heard that song, looking for love in all the wrong places? <laughs> I'm not going to sing it for you now. Rindani, would you hit the keys? It's, it's in B flat, my bro. Because you're going to be very flat if you <laughs> look for love. And all that. But that's what's wrong with the world today. We don't have the love of God. We feel unloved and we're looking for love in all the wrong places. And when we go looking for love, worldly love always takes. You know, I remember doing this. I do a lot of trainings with men about how to walk in sexual purity because it is a pandemic in the world today. And I say to them this. Love always gives, lust always takes. So when you look at another woman, are you releasing the love of God, the presence and atmosphere of heaven? Or are you lusting in terms of what can I get? Love always gives, lust always takes. So, understand this. The reason we find ourselves... Looking for love in all these places is because we are broken. Anyone here not broken, I'd like to meet you. We are all broken in some ways. Therefore, we are all needy in some ways. And therefore, we gravitate to relationships where we can have those needs met. And I want to say to you that God did not create us to be like that. God created us to be so full of his love, so full of everything that he gives us, our sense of identity, our comfort, our wholeness, so that we can stand side by side, even in marriage, side by side as a team. I don't need you to love me to feel good about myself. Therefore, we can be a team and accomplish what God's called us to do. When God created Adam, he did not create Eve with her. Did you notice that? And he gets Adam to name all the animals, and they're all male and female. So Adam's in the garden. All right, Mr. and Mrs. Ant, Mr. and Mrs. Doggy. They're so cute, God. It's so cute. Oh, Mr. and Mrs. Giraffe. But he has no Eve. And I don't know how long it took him to name all the animals. I studied zoology in Vasti, and it takes some people all their lives to figure out how many names of critters there are. And then later... God brings Eve. Why? Because God wanted Adam to know, Adam, you're not like the animals. I need to be your first love. I need to be the one that you get everything from first. I am your first and foremost relationship. And unless you learn to take me as your first and foremost definer, comforter, identity, source of everything, you will try and get that from your wife. And you'll not be able to serve me as a team. Are you catching this? I want to say this, Carol and I, and many other marriage couple counselors will agree that one of the greatest issues in marriages that are going through troubles is that they are trying to get from one another what God only intended them to get from Him. You want a healthy marriage? Get healthy in God. Get full of His love. And so although we know how we meant to live, it's not a lack of knowledge, although we know how we are meant to live, I think the majority of us find ourselves... Impacted by our impatience. How many times are you undone by your unkindness? Entrapped by envy, a prisoner of pride, disposed to dishonoring, surprised by your selfishness, in anguish because of your anger, having trouble trusting, hard to hope, problems with perseverance, 
Any of you relate? It's like, Jesus, I want to be like you. I'm more like that. Full of fear. How many of you look at all that and go, I don't want to be like that. But I find myself being like that. And I want to say this to you, that all of these human struggles are not the result of a lack of knowledge. Man, half of you can probably quote all the scriptures of how we meant to live, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, what love looks like, and, and the, the scriptures about living like Jesus. We can quote it. We know it. And like me in my early ministry, I was teaching Bible school, preaching messages, walking all over, teaching people about the love of God, living in Christian character. I was known to be one of the greatest teachers on Christian character, and I didn't have any. And we can deceive ourselves into thinking just because we know it, we must be doing it. It took me years to actually start to live what I was preaching. I'm still trying to get that right. Ask my wife. <laughs> you know, it's easy to be a successful Christian in the world's eyes. Successful church go, but what are we in God's eyes? Why don't you turn with me if you got your Bibles or your Huawei or your iPhone or your Samsung to 1 Corinthians 13. I want us to catch this. And so for those that brought their Bibles, it's good to hear the rustling of cell phones being tapped. I have said often that I'm going to develop an app that when you open your Bibles on your phone, it's going to make that little paper sound. You know, every time you swipe. Thank you, Carla Heinle, for having an actual real one. There are, there are printed versions, by the way. I don't know if some of you knew that. There's like a... 1 Corinthians 13. I can get it all right. How many of you as Christians? I speak in tongues. I am spirit-filled. But if I speak in the tongues of men and angels but have not love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. I can have the gift of prophecy. I can stand up and impress people by knowing things that no one could have known. How many people prophesy without love? I can fathom all mysteries, knowledge. If I have a faith that can move mountains that we sang about this morning, but do not have love, I am nothing. Everyone say, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor, give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but have not love, I gain nothing. Everyone say, nothing. I haven't had a whole lot of encounters, spiritual encounters in my life outside of the natural, you know, visions of Jesus, experiences, being caught up into the third heaven. But I have had one in particular that, that really impacted me in a hotel room in KwaZulu-Natal. And I had a vision of Jesus. And he walked into the room and he, and he showed me a whole lot of things, showed me heaven. And in this vision... He said to me, now, I at this stage was going to what would have been called a faith movement church. You know, where it's all about faith. If you have enough faith, you'll be a millionaire. If you have enough faith, nothing can, and faith is very important. But any of you ever coming out of that heard the statement, faith is the currency of heaven? How many of you have heard that? Right? Many hands. I can't see your hands there, but you can raise them too if you're online. And Jesus looked at me and said, Andrew, You've heard and you've taught that faith is the currency of heaven. But he said, faith isn't the currency of heaven. Love is the currency of heaven. And he said to me, no kingdom transaction can truly take place without true love. And there are people moving in amazing faith, but they have no love. Just say, wow. Now say it backwards. Wow. Wow. And so the answer to all of that, he carries on in verse 4. Love? Well, love is patient. Love is kind. Does not envy. Doesn't boast. It's not proud. Does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs, does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. You see, friends, one of the reasons we don't get this right is not from lack of learning. It's lack of love. 
It's not from trying harder because I can tell you that as an early Christian, I tried really hard to get it right. This doesn't come from trying harder. It comes from being filled fuller <laughs> with his love. It doesn't say Andrew tries hard and therefore becomes more patient. Now, yes, listen, there is a little bit of effort and choice involved. Don't get me wrong. But press into his love. There's, you know, John the Apostle, many of you know of the 12 apostles. John was the only apostle left in the last decade. Every other of the 12 had been martyred. Some of them had lost their heads. I think Paul had been beheaded during Domitian. And Domitian, we had Nero who persecuted the church intensely. The huge persecution that took place and the scattering of the Christians from Jerusalem. We have Domitian who then started to just kill and wipe out, martyr many of the apostles. John, the, the apostle who was referred to, remember when John writes his book, he says, the disciple who Jesus loves. That's how he refers to himself. He, he got the revelation of love, John. And John, Domitian tried to kill him by boiling him in a cauldron of oil. And God protected him, and all he came out with was a nicer complexion. And so Domitian exiles him to the island of Petmos. And while he's on this, like, wilderness, it's kind of like Robin Island. Is it Robin Island? Yeah, that one. And he's standing there, and the presence of heaven comes down. He hears a voice saying, John, come up here. And he has this incredible revelation of heaven, which we have as the last book of our Bible. And God shows him what's about to happen. Many scholars will tell you that a lot of the persecutions that were prophesied in that came to pass in AD 75 when Jerusalem was sacked and the Romans came and destroyed and just slaughtered the, the entire population of Jerusalem, virtually killing one, leaving another. One was taken, one was left. Destroyed and broke down the temple. That incredible persecution. And in that, Jesus gives him seven love letters to the churches of the day. And then John, after that, he leaves Patmos and he goes back to Ephesus. He's an old man. He's the last apostle living. He has seen trouble come and go. He has seen the tribulations. He has seen all the false messages and heresies that are coming into the church. And he now writes his last letters. His last message to the church as the last standing apostle. And what is 1 John, 2 John, 3 John all about? Anyone want to take a guess? Love. That is one four-letter word that you can speak and receive every day, every minute. His whole focus, the last thing that he said, love. 1 John 4, he says things like this. And I want you to just catch this. Just listen. Sometimes people switch off when we're just reading. I want you to listen to what John says to the church. Dear friends, let us love one another. Dear friends, sitting here today watching, let us love one another. Let us love one another. <laughs> Jesus said it's easy to love those who love you. What about those who don't? What about love your enemies? For love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. How many of you have been born of God? Know God? Then let it manifest in love. Whoever does not love does not know God. How many people claim to know God, but they have no love? I hope you're getting the message. Because God is love. God doesn't just love. God is love. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. You see, if love were defined in how we relate to God, it'd be messed up. We're broken. <laughs> I love Psalm 103 where it says, As a father has compassion on his children, so he has compassion on me, because he remembers how I was formed, that I am but dust. He knows that we don't have the capacity to love him properly. So he says, Let me fill you with my love first so that you can love. So I want to say this to you. If you have a problem loving others, make it your goal to be full of God's love and receiving his love. Make it your goal to know that he loves you and live in that love. Because God, when he is in you, God is love. Therefore, having God in you means having love in you. 
Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God. We will one day, but if we love one another, then God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. I'm just pulling a few things out that John says. i say one more thing. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. You want more of God? Live in love. We love because he first loved us. Friends, you cannot love by trying harder. You cannot love by willing yourself to love. You love by he loved me first. You love by receiving his love first. You love by first thing in the morning waking up and say, Dad, I receive your love. Give me that great big hug. Oh, yes, thanks, Dad. That's amazing. He pushes right past. He doesn't look at your sin. He's not standing there judging. God did not come to condemn. He came to love and save. So if that's the mission of the church, what should the church be doing? How did the world see the church? I think the world sees the church as condemning, judgment. You did that. You did that. You did. That's not the, the ministry of Jesus. The ministry of Jesus is unconditional love. Which brings us to my second point. Love is true discipleship. We, we, man, we teach on, believe, and practice discipleship because that is how the kingdom grows. We don't just want people to get saved. We don't just want believers. Jesus said, go make disciples of every person. But what kind of disciples you make? You can make theological disciples. You can make a committed army of disciples. An angry group of radicals mad at the world. Because there are a lot of Christians like that. Or you can make disciples full of love who love. We are called to be disciples who make disciples. <laughs> but how do we make disciples? Jesus' final instructions, Matthew 28, go make disciples. Teach them all that I've commanded you, etc. But what does he say to the disciples in John 13, verse 35? I don't know if anyone can guess what he said. Can you guess? How will people know that we are disciples of Jesus? Because we can quote our Bibles. Because we can answer them and have every single answer to every question. Because we're a better arguer than them or because we've got a bigger smile. They know that we're his disciples by our love one for another. Are we disciples who love those we disciple? While we're discipling people in the word, while we're discipling people in living the life of Jesus, are we discipling them in love? Let me ask you this. If you go to people in the world who aren't Christians nor around church much, and you ask them, what would you say is the thing that stands out to you most about the Christian church in the world today? How many of them would say, love? The church is such a loving group of people. I just want to go and be a part of a church because the Christians, I know they're so loving. They're so unconditionally accepting. They just forgive. They don't hold grudges. They're, they're always giving no matter what. Hmm. Because if we're not like that, then we're not really the church of Jesus Christ fully yet. Would you agree? One of the things Jesus said to me when I was having this experience with him, he said, Andrew, help the church become the church I'm coming back for. And I was like, what's that? He said, you know, there are many different metaphors for the church in the Bible. We're a building. We're an army. We're a family. But what is he coming back for? A bride. He's coming back for a bride. And I know a lot of Christians who are in the army with their weapons and aggro and violent about it. But they know nothing about being the bride. They know nothing about loving intimacy. Why do I know Christians like that? Because I used to be one. Sorry, darling. <laughs> My wife had to help me with so many things when we got married. I got to tell you. <laughs> I, had, I had someone come up to me a while back, and they were like, 
new Christian. There's so many commands in Scripture. There's so many things that we have to do. How do you know what to do when? Have you ever like looked at them? There's so many things. Do this to the poor. Do that. You know, give us. And I immediately said, well, you know, Jesus was asked that same question, and this was his answer. One of the teachers of the law, one of the scabs or parasites, uh, scribes or Pharisees, come. Of all the commandments, and there are hundreds, which is the most important? What does Jesus say? The most important one is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And the second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no command greater than these. You want to keep all the commands? Love. Now, I think Jesus realized that because we're broken, love your neighbor as yourself. You know that most of us haven't learned to love ourselves yet. So a little later on, he says, a new command I give you that you to love one another as I have loved you. Let him heal you so you can love like he loves. Romans 13, you don't have to go Roman over there, but you know Romans 13 says this, love is the fulfillment of the law. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. Kevin York, many of you know him, he's been around, he's a church coach, he's helping us work through some of our new systems in the Joburg Citywide Church. And he said this once, that really struck me, he said, I go all over the world, I minister to churches, not just every nation churches, but he coaches, helps them establish systems, their church are big churches. And he says, you know what, troubles me the most in all the churches that I go to, see everywhere I go, I see the sin of lovelessness. Great, amazing, powerful churches. So, we need to learn to live in love. Read this in 1 John 4. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. We love because he first loved us. Can I say this in closing? No, with or without your permission. I got the mic. <laughs> Jesus actually considers it a really big deal that his church is living in love. It's not a small issue. It's not, okay, guys, your numbers are up. Your worship's great. Your excellence is there. Your online presence, your YouTube channel is cooking. Just try and love a little more. Actually, he goes a little further than that. In Revelation chapter 2, if you have your Bible and you want to turn there. But remember, I spoke about John getting the revelation about these seven churches. One of the most successful churches, according to scholars and historians at the time, was the church in Ephesus. It was the church that Paul had probably invested more time, effort, and energy personally than any other church of the time. I'm not quite sure where he gets the numbers, but one of my scholar friends, Stephen Ertzik, says that it was in the region of 10,000 people. But it was a big church. It was a successful church. It was well known. And Jesus says this, John, tell the church in Ephesus, Revelation 2.2, 2, I know your deeds. You're doing well. Your hard work. Well done, team. You've served well. You work hard. Your perseverance. I know that you don't tolerate wicked people. You've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and found them false. You have persevered. Well done, church. You've endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. No. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You know how many times God's reminded me of that? Andrew, yeah, okay, you're ministering well. You, you're doing okay. You know, you, you, you got some skills. Where's the love gone? Consider how far you have fallen. It's not like, please, please just love a little more. Church, you've forgotten how to love. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent. 
Go back to that love that you had in the first place. If you don't repent, I'm going to come and remove your lampstand, which was the sign of the authority of them as a church. In other words, if you don't love, you can't be my church. Whoa. Christianity really is not about getting all those things right to the detriment of not loving. It's not about keeping all the rules. Uh, too many Christians I know live in some kind of striving relationship with God instead of a loving relationship with Him. Where are you? And I want to tell you, to understand the love of God is beyond our ability. You may not fully experience the love of God in its fullness while we live in this side of heaven, but we've got to get closer and closer every day. How many of you as parents, how many parents are here? I see those hands. How many children are here? How many of you are children of parents? Okay, good. Let me tell you something. When, when our children were born and I'm holding them, it's like, oh my gosh. <laughs> That love that I feel is like, you know, you don't know until you've had that baby. And you're holding that baby in your arms. It's like, what is this? I would die for this little thing. It can't even speak. It's not potty trained. It keeps me awake at night, but I love it so much. Watching my children grow up, the love that I feel for my children cannot be expressed in words. How can that young child, how can a parent ever sit down and say to that child in words what you feel for them? Paul recognized this. Can you imagine the love of God so much greater that I want to close with this scripture? He said to the Ephesians, the very same church that Jesus said you need to learn to love. He said, I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide, how long, how high, how deep is the love of Christ. In other words, you cannot grasp it without God's power coming to enable you to grasp it. Just grasp it. And to know that love that surpasses knowledge. Remember I said this doesn't come from learning, it comes from loving. Your knowledge of God does not mean you love him and know his love. Too many know God, but they don't know his love. You live in a semi-Christianity. To know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. How many of you would like that? You may be a tiny little bod compared to God, but that soul of yours is eternal and has capacity to be filled with the fullness of God. How do I get filled with the fullness of God? By being filled with His love. God is love. Amen. So I want to say this. You know, His disciples watched Jesus. They watched Him pray. They watched the effectiveness of His prayers. And they said, Lord, teach us how to pray. I believe one of the prayers we should be crying out as a church today is, Lord, teach us how to love. Why don't you stand with me as we close? Scripture tells us in a few places the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Who lives in you? Holy Spirit, would you come and fill this place again? Holy Spirit, would you come and fill every person here, every person watching? And I ask that the love of God would be shed abroad in our hearts again right now by the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you have been so hurt loving relationships that you made a decision to say I'm not going to get hurt again but you know that's a decision to say I'm not going to love again because the more I love the more I make myself vulnerable to being hurt 
Some of you have been hurt that you shut down those love channels. Maybe some of you didn't get the love you needed, so you just let that love channel dry up. I'm going to ask Holy Spirit right now to open up your love channels again. Lord Jesus, come with your grace, your mercy, your power, and open up those channels of love you designed and created us to live in, to be full of, to drink deeply. Why don't you say this with me? Hey, Dad. I love you. Thanks that you love me. I'm sorry I don't love myself as much as you love me. Teach me to know how much you love me. Help me to see myself the way you see me. And I give you my soul. The pain, the hurt, the disappointments. I open up again. Fill me with your love. Restore my heart to be open to love. Holy Spirit, come fill me with the love of God. Let it go beyond knowledge, beyond my understanding. I'm asking you now, Dad, reveal to me your love. Release your love upon me. I receive it. I just bathe in that for a moment. Increase your love, Dad. Would you come and give a big dad hug to every one of your children right now? Big kiss on the forehead. That's what Dad did when I first saw him. He jumped out of that throne, came, grabbed me, threw his arms around me, kissed me on the head, threw me in the air, and I was like, Wow, you're not nearly as serious as I was taught. Big smile on his face. Dad, release your love right now. And Dad, make us people who are so full of your love that we spill it everywhere we go. That it may be said of your church once again, Wow, they're your disciples because of the way they love. Just start to receive. Just receive. Just drink in that love. I'm caught up in your presence. This was the song playing in my heart this morning. I just want to sit here. Just sit at his feet now. I'm caught up in this holy moment. I never want to leave. I never want to leave. We're not just here for your blessings, Jesus. I just want you. I just want you, Jesus. I just want you, and nothing else, and nothing else, and nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you, and nothing else, nothing else. 
us again, Lord. Fill us again, Lord. Let the love of God be shed abroad in your hearts by the Holy Spirit. Fill us, Lord, as vessels of love. We want to go from this place not just loving you, loving ourselves, loving those that love us, but many of us are going into places with Christmases where we are around people that are hard to love, and we want you to give us the grace to show love. We want you to make us vessels of love this Christmas. We want you to make us those who shine love, spill love. Every dinner, every meal, that it's not about the food, it's about the love of God shed abroad in our hearts, poured out to those around us. Let this be the most loveful Christmas we've ever had. Make us a church that loves the world doesn't condemn it, that loves our enemies, forgives them, doesn't become bitter or resentful. Fill us with that love, Lord. Send us out in that love. And you loving God, Lord, bless us and keep us. Lord, make your face shine upon us and be gracious to us. Lord, lift up your countenance on us and give us your shalom, your eternal unconditional agape love in Jesus name and all God's people said amen God bless you you take that you be filled with it you every morning say Lord fill me with your love help me to love you and others more today than ever before and man will he answer those prayers love you guys have a blessed Christmas lots of grace for those who are traveling let it be a restful time in his love amen